or dignified in any other part of the community. And human dignity is a big topic, hot topic issue in our culture today, as we all know. So what is it? Pope John Paul II says about human dignity, he says, in fact, as a person, man is the only creature on earth that which God wills for itself. What does this mean? This means that we've been created for our own sake. What do I mean? A tree out there has been created for human sake, for my sake. I can go outside, cut down a tree, chop it up, make firewood, and heat up my home. Right? I can go outside, cut down a tree, shred it up, and make paper. I'm allowed to use creation as a means to my own end. I shouldn't have used creation. I shouldn't go out there and just like cut down a tree and then just leave it there or you know, kill an animal and I use it for food or shelter. But nonetheless, I'm allowed to use creation as a means to my own end. But you and I, We've been created for our own sake. We are never, ever, ever meant to be used as a means to someone else's own end. And this is such an important point, because lust in the human heart, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end, kind of leads individuals to use others as a means to one's own end. It's almost like I have an itch, and I want someone else to scratch it. It goes completely against our human dignity, the fact that we've been created for our own sake. Dignity itself means elevated rank, something that has an innate right to respect and ethical treatment. That means that you, just by the fact that we are human, we are an elevated rank, and we have an innate right to respect and ethical tre treatment from the moment of conception until natural death. I mean, think about this. Every single human being on earth reveals something about God's beauty, his glory, his greatness, that no other person can reveal. Thank you, Marcus. What's your name? Yeah. Tina. You reveal something about God's beauty, his glory, his greatness, his love, that no one in this room can reveal, no one out there can reveal, no one has ever re revealed or will ever reveal. It's your gift to share with this world. And this goes for every single one of us. You as a person, you are unique, unrepeatable. There's no other you out there. Only you hold this precious gift of yourself to reveal something about God's beauty, His glory, His greatness, His love. And if you don't recognize that, if you deprive the world of the gift of yourself, you are literally depriving the world of something awesome, of something beautiful, something glorious. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, I don't think, you know, Joe Schmo in my class or at work is such a great gift. And I think we all can relate to that in one way or another. Because what happens is that human sin, my sin, and your sin blocks us from seeing the beauty and the dignity of the other human person. Mother Teresa had purity of heart. You know why we have pray for purity of heart? What does Jesus say in the, in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see. All right, God. The, the purer our heart becomes, the more we see God in everything. Mother Teresa had purity of heart. She could go up to a person lying in a gutter with a sense of unbelief, uh, with maggots crawling over this person, she would pick up this person, take this person to a nearby shelter, clean, love, take care of this person. Because she could see Jesus in the dignity of the human person. We all had a pray for purity of hearts. And as I said, we have been made in the image and likeness of God, and if we could see God within our own bodies, our body itself, our human person itself, would reveal to us God's great mystery. What do you mean by God's great mystery? We can put God in one word. What did John say in his letters? He says, God is love. God is love. All right, to understand what it means that God is love, first we have to understand what love is and how love works. Sorry, right, what love is. I mean, we say that word for all sorts of things, right? We say, I love my mom and dad. I love pizza. I love my wife. I love my dog. There is a huge difference between loving your wife and loving pizza, right? At least I hope there is. <laughs> All right, true authentic love is longing for the other person's good, choosing and acting for the other person's good. There's no selfish profit involved in it. Aching, longing for the other person's good, which is good for the other. How love works? Well, obviously you know how love works, right? I know this is not going to be rocket science to you guys, but how many people do, how many persons do you need in order to have a loving relationship? Obviously, too, right? So let's pretend we've got John and Mary. John's kind of interested. Mary, what's John going to first do? John's going to ask out Mary. So we know love has to have at least two persons, John, and then love has to be initiated, right? That's a beginner. In order for the relationship to continue, what does Mary have to do? She's got to say yes. Sign on the I'm sorry. All right, so Mary has to say yes. All right, so we know love has to receive and accept it. And then in order for the relationship to continue, what does Mary have to do? 
especially over the day. So we know love has to go two ways. So we know how, what love is, how love works, and now we can talk about how God is love. A lot of us think that God is love because God loves us, that's part of it. But it's much more beautiful and profound than that. God is love because he is within himself love. How many persons do we believe that there is obviously the one God? Three, right? So we got God the Father from all eternity is pouring out his life and love to God the Son. The Son is receiving the love of the Father, accepting it, and then giving himself back to the Father. The love between the Father and the Son is so powerful, so beautiful, so real, that it is a whole other person. The Holy Spirit is nothing within himself but the exchange of love between the Father and the Son. So God is love because he within himself is this explosion of love, intimacy, union, communion. There's literally this love bomb exploding in the heavens, longing, choosing, acting for what is good for us. In itself. As we say in the Creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. He is the love between the Father and the Son. So now, we've got two beings. We've got God and we've got man who are meant to participate in the relationship with each other. In order for that relationship, keep in mind, I'm bringing us to a deeper reading about sexual union. How the physical body reveals everything that I'm talking about, which I'm going to kind of close with. So just keep following me with where I'm going here, right? So we've got two beings who are meant to participate in a relationship with each other. God and man. Just kind of like using that data analogy, in order for that relationship to get going, what does God first have to do? He's got to pour out, he's got to initiate his life and love. What did the priest say when he raised up the host? This is my body, which will be given up. You God is pouring out his life and love to us. In order for that relationship to continue, what does man have to do? We're going to receive God's life and love, right? When do we receive God's life and love? In the Eucharist, right? First and foremost, in baptism, and every single time we receive that light host, we are literally receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, life and love itself. But if you're quenching, in order for that to continue, what does man have to do? We've got to give ourselves back to God. We've got to show up. All right? Now, what happens is that a lot of people find, and you, especially if you're, if you're a teacher or a CCD teacher, you might even find it yourself, a lot of us find religion, the Mass, Eucharist, very important. Right, there's reason for it. My generation, your generation, we are so used to sitting down, watching something, and we expect to be entertained, right? So we sit, we watch, we got video games, we got TV, we got concerts, we got the internet, we got the smartphones. We sit, we watch, we expect to be entertained. So a lot of us, just by the way we've been formed growing up, we sit at mass, we watch mass, and if, you know, so a few years ago, I was like, what the heck am I doing? Bored. All right? Now, now I was studying the priest for seven years. And Jesus and Mary told me to get out of seminary. But what, one thing I was told a lot by people was that if I became a priest, when I became a priest, they said, Colin, you know, have funny homilies, make sure the music's good. And that's all good stuff. I mean, music's very important in the Mass. Funny homilies are great. Right? But the Mass has not been developed in a way to give us a form of entertainment. God's given us enough forms of entertainment. The Mass has been developed in a way to participate in relationship with God. I mean, think about it. So let's use our imaginations for a second, right? I hope it's not too much of imagination for you. But imagine that I'm on a blind date with a girl, okay? And I don't know anything about it. And she starts telling me all about herself. She's telling me about her family, her friends, what she does for a living. What if I was on the other side of the table, kind of like not really paying attention to her, kept checking on watch, all the huge Giants and Mets fan, I'm like checking the scores out there. And then right when she was done talking, I got up and I walked out of that restaurant without saying a word to her. Bro, what did you say to me? Jerk. This guy's going to think he is. Right, how many of us experience mass like this? Or are you possibly in a relationship with God like this? I mean, this is, I'm talking more when I was in high school, but I was just thinking when I was in high school. And I, when I go to mass, first of all, the only reason, the only reason why I was going to mass was because I, my parents were forcing me to go to mass. All right? And what was happening? So, mass, so God, the mass is developed in a way to participate in a relationship with God. God is pouring out his life and love to me. What am I doing, right? So, mass begins. All right, God starts pouring out his life and love to me. What am I doing? I'm thinking the Giants are playing at 4 o'clock. I'm thinking what I did over the weekend. I'm thinking about what's going on next week. That's what's going on, going on. I'm standing up for the gospel. God starts pouring out his life and love to the gospel. I'm talking to my buddy. I'm like, yo, dude, that girl's got a cube over there. That girl's got a cube over there. Not paying attention. We go to receive the Eucharist. We're supposed to do the sign of the cross. We're all like, we should fly in front of our face. Right? We're not paying attention. And all we're waiting for is mass is ended. Go with peace. But I'm out of there. 
Sometimes I go to Mass, I receive the Eucharist, and I walk out that back door because I fulfilled my Sunday obligation. And I was open up the drive, I go to Mass, I grab Bolton, I go to the mall, I go home, and be like, look, I'm dying with the Mass. Is there any relationship going on between me and God? Of course we're good. And the relationship aspect of God with prayer, with the Mass, if we're going to put anything into it, in the relationship, we're not going to get much out of that relationship. If I'm going to date with a girl, if I'm not hearing what she's saying, understanding, understanding it, then I'm some type of intelligent conversation back, it's going to be no second thing. I encourage you guys, if you, if you feel like you don't get much out of the match, if you don't get much out of sitting in front of the Eucharist, praying to God, give it time. You know, I, I'm not saying to pay attention to the whole mass. I mean, our, statistically, our, our attention spans are three to five, three to five seconds. One like two. I know it's not like to be able to pay attention. All right, but start off with the gospel. I mean, you know, God's pouring out His life and love for the gospel. Try to understand it, out into your heart, and then act it out. A lot of the gospels you can apply in your life. I talk to them. Tell them what's going on with your heart. Give them your feelings. Give them your emotions. Tell them all the longings and desires of your heart. You give God ten minutes a day. Just, the, the more you spend time with someone, the more you'll get to know someone. Right. And that's why Jesus came in the flesh. He wanted a body-to-body, physical physical relationship with him. All right, so that's the kind of boring theology. I'm going to kind of hit home about how this all relates to our sexual morality. See what God is doing here, all right? God, who is pure love, is initiating his life and love to humanity, all right? He wants all of humanity to receive his life and love and accept it. He wants that life and love to grow inside of us. And he wants us to pour forth that life and love back to himself and to the whole world. You guys are following me so far, right? So now I'm going to explain. This is, this is like a deep, profound, theological like, point that doctors of the church have spent years in you know, trying to, to understand this better. Now I'm going to be using different terms explaining this, this reality. I'm going to be using pretty much sexual analogy. You can explain it. It's how the Bible explains it. It's how the church explains it. And right away, we're going to be very uncomfortable about bringing sexual reality into this mouth. Because there's two reasons. One, because we grew up with that whole mentality, spirit good, body bad, which is Manichaeism, which is actually a heresy in the church. And also because a lot of us look through sexual morality through a prism of lust. Right? So put it this way, and that is you know, because of the fall. So because of the original sin, we all struggle with this. So when I say the word sex, do we think of God, Trinity, or do we think of something a little less unholy? Probably something a little less unholy. All right. So that's why we're going to feel that tension and that uncomfortableness about bringing sexual morality or sex, sexual analogies into God. And if, and if we are looking at it through lust, then we should feel uncomfortable because we're taking something that is sacred, profound, and bringing it down to our own, you know, e- you know, evil within our eyes, in a sense. But with careful language with the power of the Holy Spirit, what I really want to try to do, especially if this is the first time you're hearing it, is trying to change that prism into a prism of life and love. Because we got to come to grips with that, guys, that what was God's first com- commandment to men? Be fruitful and multiply. God's first commandment to Adam and Eve was to have sex. Married man and woman, Adam and Eve, to have sex. Alright? So, now using the, the, the sexual now keep in mind what I'm saying is an analogy. I mean, it's a no other analogy, as I would say, right? It's, it's an example that leads us to a deeper meaning, deeper understanding of the truth. I'm not saying that God is sexual, or what's happening in the Trinity, the sexual relationship between God and man is not saying that at all. But nonetheless, it's supposed to remember the physical reveals something. The physical reveals something invisible, and that's what we're supposed to be seeing in within our very own box. So God, who is pure life and love, is initiating his life and love to love humanity. He wants all of humanity to receive his life and love. In a sense, using the analogy, conceive his life and love. He wants that life and love to grow with inside of us. And he wants us to give birth to that life and love back to himself into the whole world. And this is not just a metaphor. There is a woman who walked on this planet who opened up herself so freely and totally and completely in God's life and love that she literally looked at her own womb, conceived and bare forth the divine life. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the perfect icon of what it means to be human, to receive 
conceive and bear forth divine life. She did it physically, or all meant to do it spiritually. God wanted this plan of initiation, of reception, conception, giving birth to, to, to divine life to be so obvious to us, so clear to us, that he, that he gave us a sign, a map, a blueprint to end us to our, to our destination, to our final destination. Do you know what God is really calling us to? A marriage. God wants to marry us. It's going to sound weird if you've never heard it, but the Bible is packed filled with marriage analogies. It begins with the marriage between Adam and Eve. It ends with the marriage between a new Adam and a new Eve, or Christ the bridegroom and the church his bride. In the Old Testament, God said that he was the husband and the Jewish people was, was his wife. In the New Testament, we have vine, branches, sheep, and shepherd was the most common analogy. Bridegroom and bride. Where is Jesus when he performs his first miracle? It's a wedding feast. Not a coincidence. Heaven in the book of Revelation is explained as a, as a wedding man. God wants to marry us. But not only does God want to marry us, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby baby care. See, literally, what little would we know with this silly nursery? I'm actually speaking some profound theology here. God is love. Then he wants to marry humanity, all of us as bride before God, and then he wants to infuse divine life and love within us. Listen to how the, 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 uh, the catechism says. God's very being is love. By sending his only son in the spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. That God himself is the eternal exchange of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here, you guys, is an absolute meaning of our lives. Ready for the next statement? And he has destined us to share in that exchange. Do you hear what I just said? He has destined us to share in that exchange. Do you know what this means? This means we've been created for love. Do we not know this? Who in this room, in one way or another, is not starving and craving for love, intimacy, union, communion? It's why we do what we do. It's why we want to date. It's why we want to be married. It's why we want to have kids. It's why we want to be popular and have all these friends. Because we crave and starve for life and love. And you should, because you've been created for it. But here's the question. Only God, only God can satisfy that ache in the human heart for life. Love and to the same union from you. It's almost like we got God shaped holes in our hearts. And if we don't realize that meant God is meant to satisfy that ache in our hearts, I guarantee you, because I spent many years building it, we're going to go from one thing to the next trying to satisfy that ache. We'll go to sex, to drugs, to alcohol, whatever it is, to, to unhealthy relationships, because we're trying to look. We're not big valuable people out there. We're starving. We're looking for love. Our culture is starving and craving for love. The music out there, 99% of the songs out there have something to do with a man and a woman in a relationship. It's all over our culture. The whole culture is starving for life. And God wanted this plan to be so obvious to us, so, so clear to us, that he put this very image in our very own bodies as male and female. The point is for our destination. And this is how the analogy kind of works. So remember, God initiates his life in love, and love, conceives his life in love, conceives his life in love, bear forth his life in love, and then gives birth of his life in love back to himself through the whole world. Christ says that I've come to give man life and joy to the full. He didn't come to give us a list of rules and to make us miserable. No, he came to give us life and joy to the full. And he wanted that plan to be so obvious to us, he, he literally chiseled it on our very own bodies. How, this is how we can reveal, God is revealed through our very own bodies. In this analogy, he gave us a map of blueprints that launch us to our end destination with union with him. And this is, if we could read the legend of the map correctly, this is what the body would be telling us. Gentlemen, men, we represent God. And if we could read this map correctly, we represent God as the initiator of his life and lung. The book lung, this is why the body part comes out of us, or in the, the life giving aspect, comes out of the man. We represent God as an initiator of his life and lung. You beautiful women, you represent all of humanity as receivers of God's life and lung. This is why you receive the man, conceive the child, and bear forth life. 
sexual union between a married man and woman is supposed to be the physical sign that reveals to all of us that God is love. And we're all meant to receive, conceive, and bear forth this life and love back to himself into the whole world. Sexual union on earth is supposed to be a little foretaste and glimmer, an experience of heaven. This does not mean that heaven is going to be this eternal sexual experience. But what these old celibate men in Rome are telling us, what the Bible is telling us, is that all the physical and emotional pleasures that are, are coming out of that act are supposed to be a little, a little, a little glimmer and foretaste of heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to get to heaven. The church is not saying not to have sexual union outside of marriage because it's bad, because it's unholy, because it's dirty. They're saying it's so good, it's so valuable, it's so powerful, so beautiful. We as a culture have no clue on how valuable it really is. And it's in our music comparing heaven and sex. It's all over the place in our music. I mean, look at, look at these songs. Well, first of all, even before I get into that, Look at what some of the catechism says. The church longs to be united with Christ her bridegroom. Because remember, guys, Christ is the bridegroom, and we are all receptive. We are all bride before God in this whole marriage analogy. And it's hard for us men to grapple with because we think we're not bride. I mean, it just you know, goes against our very nature. But we're a man and a woman. We are meant to receive God's life and love. The church longs to be united with her bridegroom in the glory of heaven, where she will one day rejoice with her beloved in the happiness and rapture ecstasy that will never end. St. Paul talks about this in the, in the, in the Gospels. He says in, in his letters, he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Right? What's he referring to? The book of Genesis, right? In the garden. And then he said, he's talking about, he says, that the two shall become one flesh. He says, talking about sexual union, St. Paul says, talking about sexual union, he says, this is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. That's why all these analogies lead us to that. Pope Benedict says, the joy of the marital embrace is meant to be a sign, a little glimmer of the ultimate purpose and reality of our existence, participation in the eternal love of the Trinity. And so it's all in scripture, it's all in the church, it's all in the Bible, but it's also all over the culture. There's, because the culture is, is, is very in tune with what the human heart is looking for. And some of it's twisted and distorted. So the thing about Satan is that God, Satan, Satan can't create anything. You can only take what God created to be true, good, and beautiful, and twisted and distorted. So all of our longings and aches and all of that's happening out in the culture, it's either God speaking to us or Satan kind of twisting what God is trying to speak to us. So put it this way, talk, combining heaven and sex. I mean, first of all, we got, you know, the great prophet Brian Adams. What does he say? He says, baby, you're all that I want when you're lying here in my arms. I'm finding it hard to believe we're in heaven. He's talking about it. And said, listen to this Lady Gaga song. This song is unbelievable. <laughs> I'm not saying Lady Gaga is this like, you know, Catholic speaker or singer. She's not. However, she is singing theology of the body, the Catholic faith, and she doesn't even know it. You know the, you know the song, The Edge of Glory? All right. The Edge of Glory. What's she talking about? What, what she's calling, she, when she's standing on the Edge of Glory, what she's talking about? She's talking about sexual union, right? She's talking about comparing sexual union being on the edge of glory. All right, listen to these lyrics. Another shot before we kiss the other side. All right, what other side is she talking about? Heaven. She's saying it. She's saying another shot before she participates in sex. She another shot before we kiss the other side. Tonight it be tonight. <laughs> Next week. I'm on the edge of something final we call life. I'm on the, on the edge of something final we call life. What's final that we call eternal life? Heaven. Right? Again, comparing sex to heaven. I want to do something final that we call life. Listen to this next lyric. Unbelievable. She, she's so close. If somebody could just sit down with her and explain the theology body to her, she's so close. Listen to this next lyric. Put on your shades because I'll be dancing in the flames. You've got to be kidding me. Think about this. Who 
always active in the sexual act besides the man and the woman? Who puts the soul into the body? The Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life. How is the Holy Spirit revealed at Pentecost? Fire. Flames of fire. Put on your shades because I'll be dancing in the flames. And the whole culture in the world thinks she's talking about hell. And she knew that the whole culture would think that she's saying that she's talking about hell. You know what her very next lyric is? It isn't hell if everybody knows my name. Lady Gaga! It isn't hell if everybody knows my name. Where are you going to be when everybody knows your name? Heaven. God is not out to get us. You know what all of this sexual confusion in our world is? It's our longing for heaven gone berserk. We have no clue what we're really looking for, what the heart is looking for. And the Catholic Church is offering it all to us. Jesus Christ is offering it all to us. Now, sexual union in marriage is also supposed to mirror the love of the Trinity supposed to mirror the love of the Trinity. And there's four aspects of love that are in the Trinity. The love is free, it's total, it's faithful, and it's fruitful. And those are the exact four areas of love that have been literally written on our hearts. I think we know that meant love is meant to be free. I don't think anybody wants an arranged marriage again. I know some of us do it that has its place, but I think most of us want to be able to choose who we want to marry. Right? We know love is meant to be total. But I say, all right, you know, I'll marry, I'll marry her. But you know, two days out of the week, I'm going to do whatever I want, with them or I want. Right? We know that's actually love. We know love has to be total. We know love is meant to be faithful. I don't think any of us are like, oh, my whole life with your spouse cheats on me, you're going to marry with her. No, right? We know love is meant to be faithful, and we know love is meant to be fruitful. We want love, peace, joy, fruitful, and, and if God's wanting to children to come out of that. Free, total, faithful, fruitful. This is the four aspects of love Christ teaches us on the cross. He says, I laid down my life freely. He gave everything, every, body, blood, soul, he did everything on the cross, he poured out for us. He totally gave us to, or, himself to us. He says, I promise to be with you till the end of time. He promises to be faithful. And he says, I have come to give man life and joy to the full. He promises to be fruitful. These are the four exact vows that you take before the altar, before the witness of the priest or deacon, when you guys get married. What are the three questions they ask you? Have you come freely without reservation? Free. Do you promise to stay together until death be you part? Total. Faithful. Do you promise to be open to children? Free. Total. Faithful. Fruitful. Our souls are united before God there. But you guys probably know this and already realize this, but are you fully married yet? At the reception, is that person, uh, is that couple fully married yet? You know, something was going on way there, but probably not though. No, when do you become fully married? When is the marriage consummated? Do we, not, do we know this or not? <laughs> no, we're just uncomfortable, we don't want to say it. When is the marriage consummated in the sexual act? Then, not in, in the Catholic Church side, you're not fully married, and even in society's eyes, you're not married. I don't know if you guys watch the rest of the development or not. But there's a whole episode on this episode uh, with Joe. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about. We'll go into it. But it's all there. And you're not fully married until you consummate the marriage. The words become flesh. Sound familiar? So in the sexual act, Pope John Paul II talks about that the body speaks a language. What do I mean by body language? If I'm angry or frustrated or mad, I wouldn't have to tell you with my words that I'm frustrated or angry or mad. I could be just slamming my fist in the ground, go right in the face, you gotta be this guy's fist. It's my body speaking language. If we realize it or not, our body speaks a, a profound language in the sexual act. So in the sexual act, I am saying, if, if I'm married and I'm participating in that act with my bride, I'm saying to her, I give myself to you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. She receives those vows with her body and then gives her vows to back to me. I give myself to you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. Sexual union. 
between a married man and woman is the fulfillment of the marriage act. It consummates the marriage. And then every single time you participate in sexual union after that, it's supposed to be a renewal of your marriage in the house. How healthy would a marriage be if you continually renewed your marriage vows? Pretty healthy. Now, I know we try to re- renew marriage vows with like our grandparents, like, you know, and, that's, and that's a beautiful thing that has its place. But we're supposed to be renewing our marriage vows every single time we participate in the sexual act. Church is not saying that sex is bad or holy, the body is bad or holy. It's saying it's so good, it's so valuable, the culture, we have no clue on how good it really is. Now, if all I'm saying is true, and there's about five to ten minutes left, if all I'm saying is true, and there's an enemy of God who doesn't want us to see this, it is true. It's using that nursery rhyme again. God is love. All right. First, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby, the baby care. God is love. He's an explosion of eternal love. Between the uh, explosion of love into his union community. Then comes marriage. He creates humanity. He wants to marry humanity, pour out and gush forth his life and love to all humanity. Then comes the baby, the baby care. She literally wants us to receive that life and love, conceive it, have it grow inside of us, and give birth to it, back to himself and to the whole world. He wanted this plan, this reality, to be so obvious to us that he literally chiseled a map in it on my very own body. And as man, I represent God as initiator of his life and life. Women, you represent all of humanity as receivers of God's life and life. And if we could see the act correctly, it's supposed to reveal to us, launch us to our end destination. If this is all true, and there's an enemy of God who doesn't want us to see our participating in relationship with God, he doesn't want us to see that in ourselves. What do you think you're going to attack? Satan points all of his arrows right here. If you want to know what is most holy and sacred in this world, see what is most violently attacked. And we can see this. We know the human body, sexual union, marriage, is ultimately being attacked. Because he's putting all of his arrows right here. That we, as a culture, as Christians, we have got to reclaim our body. We have to reclaim the sexual act. It's our, it's not his. He's the great plagiarizer. He takes something that is God's and he puts his name on it. So again, I ask you, when I say the word sex, do we think of Trinity, God, meaning of life? Or do we think of something a little less unholy? Probably something a little less unholy because he's, he's stolen it from us. And he put his name on it. We've got to reclaim it. There's two things that Satan tries to do. Women, you guys are the. I usually have about another 45 minutes to go. It's kind of time to try to put it into like six minutes. So bear with me. But women, you are key to this plan. You represent all of humanity as receivers of God's life and love. You're key to the plan. Who did the serpent go up to in the garden? Eve. Why? She's the weaker sex? No. Because in a sense, she's the more perfect sex. She's the key to the plan. Every single time I look at a beautiful woman, I'm supposed to be saying, damn, that woman is beautiful. She reminds me that God is like the mother meant to receive, conceive, and bear forth that life and love back himself into the whole world. Gentlemen, is that what we're saying every time we see a beautiful woman? I'm not even going to tell you the terms I hear on the talks in the high schools. To see what's happening, he attacks two things. He attacks two things. He, what Satan wants to do, he wants to affect how men look at women and how women look at themselves. I don't have time to really be able to break that all down to you of how he does it, but we can imagine how he's very successfully changed how men look at women. And guys, and I'll say it quickly, but the most effective way that he has affected how men look at women is through pornography. It is an addiction that is everywhere. And I beg you, if you struggle with that, God bless you. You're not alone. You'd be shocked by the numbers of how many men are. Um, there's confession, there's real glory, there's redemption, there's help in those areas. Go with Christ. Women, the most powerful way that he's affected you to say how you look at yourself is to convince the woman that she's not beautiful. 
If you struggle, and I wish I had more time to go through this, but if you struggle with any body image, I have three sisters. And this, this point always is home for me because one of my sisters was small, but seemed beautiful. I needed this sort of knowledge because she was convinced that she was not beautiful. And in the high school, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. With the cutting that's going on, the eating disorders that are going on. I wish I could spend more time on it, but if there's any part of you that does not, because of some type of physical attribute of your body, if you do not think you are beautiful because of that, that is literally a lie that's been spoon fed to you from the depths of hell. You are beautiful. Every single woman. And, if, and the Satan doesn't want you to see your beauty. Because when you see your beauty and you recognize your beauty, you are glorious. You are radiant. You shine heaven. Because women, you guys are icons of heaven. Heaven is the dwelling place of whom? God. Who else was the dwelling place of God? Our Lady. Our Lady's womb was heaven. It was literally a heaven. The fact that Our Lady was able to do that, that reveals to you, every single one of you women, that you guys, if you were the chosen one, literally could have had heaven dwelling within you. And you do. Because remember, Mary is the, is the physical, uh, of, she's the pinnacle of what it means to be woman, to be bride. And when you when you when you're shining and you're glorious, you know the only way that John is able to explain our lady through in, the, in, the, in his letters, what does he say? The woman clothed with the sun. He couldn't even he couldn't even look at her. She was so bright, bright and glorious. That's what's going to redeem the culture. That's what's going to change our culture. We, the, the new the new evangelization is not going into those. Uh, you know, the college dorm rooms and being like, all right, everyone's trying to, you know, get drunk, get laid at the scene. You're all, it's not going in there and saying you're all going to hell. It's going in there and saying, you know what you're really looking for? And explaining to them what we're, they're really looking for. Why did drunk get, get drunk, get laid go hand in hand? Because we got to desensitize. It's like as we feel the pain, our conscience is bothering us in this, in this scene. It's like, that's why we got nerves. If I'm getting hotter to a hot plate, what's my hand going to start doing? When our conscience is bothering us because we're getting closer and closer to the fire and the sin, things that are bad for us, and so in order for us to kind of not feel that anymore, a lot of the cause kids, they get, you know, they, they get drunk. It kind of t- it weakens down the conscience. Remember I said about how the evil one twists and distorts things? Twist it and distort alcohol, then it's drunk. What do we got? St. Paul says, be inebriated by the Holy Spirit, not by wine. That's what you're looking for. We're all supposed to be wasted on God's life and love. People should think, my, my friends are smoking, they still smoke, I'm 30. My friends walk around high a lot. And, and so a, a good friend of mine, a Catholic friend of mine told me, he said, if, if somebody doesn't think you're high on, on, on life and love, then you're not living the Christian faith. And you can see twisted and distorted on the way that my friends feel. They're going to, to the, they're, they're selling for the counter thing. Untwist, get laid. What are you looking for? Marriage, love, intimacy, unity, communion. We gotta untwist all that Satan has twisted and get the good news out there. And I'm out of time. I'm sorry, I wish I had a lot more time to be able to break this down. I give you guys a pretty much two and a half hour talk in like, 50 minutes, so forgive me if it was all over the place. Well, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, full of grace with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, the mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about theology of the body, I would, I would recommend uh, looking up Christopher West. Or Dr. Janet Smith, um, Brian Butler. There's a lot of info out there about that. I, I'm going to leave my cards up here if you have any questions um, on Facebook or uh, you just email me if there's any questions that you guys ever want. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was asked to give the vote of thanks to Mr. Colin DeCasa. Uh, so I have to write it down because I'm not good at making it up. So, on behalf of the MCYM and the Sir Munger ex of North America, I would like to offer a sincere thanks to Mr. Colin Acosta, the Director of Young Adult Outreach in the Archdiocese of North America in New York, sorry. <laughs> I personally had the chance to hear Colin once before at the 
Beauty Expo retreat in New Jersey, and a couple of you guys here also were there. Um, it was a great talk back then, because <laughs> you had much more time. You hit all the topics that we needed to hear. Um, I thank you, Colin, for speaking to us about what we need to hear on a topic that we rarely ever talk about in our respective churches. Um, I hope that more of our youth and more of our people, adults even, can have the chance to hear your talk in the future. Um, you talk about the relationship with God to the sexual morality and the analogies of that. And I thank you for changing our mindset regarding sex. From this prism of lust that you talked about, and we want to transform that prism into, like you said, life of love. Um, so Colin, thank you for taking your time to come to us here in this isolated area <laughs> and coming to talk to us. And I, I think you're probably the only person, probably the only person in the world that would ever bring up Lady Gaga to talk about her <laughs> in a good life. But thank you, Colin. Um, brotherly, brotherly. So we are coming in our mind regardless. This is a talking of our love. So today, you know, we, I think uh, as, as you said, it's a war subject and um, it's need uh, more and more time. But he, in a way, reduced into half an hour, yeah? So uh, I think uh, we need a more uh, talk and inputs like this. So. Uh, this is from Kerala, and uh, <laughs> this is the talk of our love, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.